If y'all have a copy of God's word with you tonight, I want to invite you to find your place in 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to start uh, this evening by looking at verse 10 and um, sharing tonight a message for deacon ordination. And we have Matt Walker with us tonight. And in just a little bit, we will have a time of laying on of hands uh, to ordain him for the deacon ministry. To let you know about our process, we have um, as a deacon ministry here, um, started a new process wherein each year we identify individuals who could potentially serve as deacons and to acclimate them and bring them on board. We have a one year period of them serving as what we call yoke fellas. And so Matt Walker has been with us for a year in that uh, position. And along that involves attending meetings that involves being a part of the deacon ministry, and uh, that involves also going through some discipleship training. So he has been a part of that. And so this afternoon, we met as a deacon ministry and reiterated that, and we're ready to move forward tonight, laying on of hands uh, by ordained individuals here and having him become a part of our deacon ministry. I wanted to start by looking at 1 Corinthians 15, 10. I appreciate Don's heart in leading us in worship and some of the songs we sang. I wanted to start here by just reminding us that all that we do tonight is by the grace of God, the grace of God, his unmerited favor. You know, the grace of God, Ephesians 2, 8, brings salvation. It's because of his kindness that we're saved. Uh, God gives us what we don't deserve though we deserve forever separation and alienation from God because of our sin, he gave us what we don't deserve. He gave us his son, the God-man, Jesus Christ, to live the spotless life we could never live on our behalf as a substitute. And then he gave us what we don't deserve. Jesus died in our place. In our place, condemned, he stood a spotless, sinless sacrifice on behalf of our lives. That's all of grace. And by grace, we are saved through faith, that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So the grace of God brings salvation, but the grace of God is also what accomplishes our sanctification. I used to be messed up on this. I thought that I got saved by grace and now it's up to me to be a good Christian and to be better and to do good. And then I learned truth from scripture like 2 Peter 3, 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I learned James chapter four, he gives more grace. It is his kindness working in my life by his Holy Spirit that gives me the ability to put to death the works of the flesh and to produce good fruit. So the grace of God enables us to grow in our sanctification journey. But it's also the grace of God that helps us when it comes to Christian service. Romans chapter 12, verses six through eight, Paul spoke of the grace of God given to each one in regard to spiritual gifts. My ability to teach the word, preach the word, my ability to lead ministry, your ability to show uh, mercy, your ability to be generous, your ability to serve in any way within the body of Christ is not because of your abilities, it is because of the grace of God working in your life by God's spirit. Now, Paul understood all of this, and that's why in 1 Corinthians 15, when he spoke about his ministry as an apostle, he referenced, he referenced the grace of God. He said, starting in verse 5, he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, speaking of Jesus' resurrection, and chapter 15 is all about the resurrection. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are alive, but some have fallen asleep. These are miraculous occurrences 
post-resurrection that confirmed that the resurrection was not a phantom appearance of Jesus. It wasn't a spirit thing. One could not deny it and say the body was simply moved or displaced. The swoon theory that was popularly, popularly claimed that Jesus just fainted and then reappeared. So all these things are false, Paul's saying. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, as to, bo- to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. Now Paul here is, is defending his apostolic ministry. Because there were people denying the truth of the resurrection, Paul wanted to say, I'm an apostle and I have the ability to share truth directly from Jesus. All of the false teachers in the church need need to be silent. They need to shut their mouths. They need to sit out on this one. They're not invited to the party to give new truth about Jesus. Only apostles are. Um, But Paul felt a little bit dirty doing that as any would because he's having to defend himself. Who likes to defend themselves and their ministry? And so he says in verse 9, for I am the least, least of the apostles, not even worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. So Paul was quick to say, I'm an apostle, but he was also quick to say, it's all by the grace of God, the unmerited kindness of Jesus. So I say to you tonight, I stand behind this pulpit, not for any other reason, but the grace of God appeared to me and called me into the ministry. Any deacon here, any minister here would have to say the same thing, it is only by the grace of God that we serve in any capacity. And uh, so I had some questions this afternoon about what I mentioned about my background and being liking the Beatles. Somebody said they would like to see a picture of me with that yellow submarine tie and long hair. I couldn't find that exact picture, but I did find a picture of me with the long hair. Can we put that on the screen at this time? There it is right there. (laughs) Thank you for that idea, Lamar. That was Lamar Pinson's idea. So that's a good one. So, but by the grace of God, I'd look like Dwight. Amen. Just joking. I love Dwight's hair. So, so we start tonight with a focus on grace and let's continue by just saying briefly a few things about deacon ministry. Deacon ministry, I know y'all are saying briefly. Did he say the word briefly? Well, um, hold me to it, all right? Number one, I, I wanna talk to you first about the precedent of deacon's mini- deacon ministry, the precedent for a deacon. And Philippians chapter one is such an important text here because here we see scripture given by divine inspiration It takes note that in the early church, there were these individuals called deacons. Paul wrote, began his letter by saying, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. So so I want us to get this tonight as a body. I want scripture to be the authority for deacon ministry I want us to see that God's word has given us counsel on this ministry. And I want you to see from scripture that when Paul addressed the church at Philippi, he regarded there being three classifications or three groups of people in the church. You have saints, literally the Greek term there, agios means holy ones. These are believers. These are the people who make up the body of Christ. Why are they called holy ones? Uh, Because if you are in Christ, you have been washed of your sins. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Faith and regeneration renders you faultless in the eyes of God. If you are justified, it's just as if you have never sinned. And when the Lord looks at you, 
He doesn't see your imperfection, your sin. He does not see you as being a lawbreaker who has violated his moral law. Instead, he sees you as being as righteous and as perfect and as sinless as Christ. That is your standing as a believer. You are a holy one by the grace of God. So he speaks generally to the church, but then he notice, he, he notes two distinct groups of people in the church, the overseers and the deacons. Now the word overseer is um, a Greek word here used of the pastor. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 5, Titus chapter 1, you'll see that there are terms used synonymously. I spoke of this recently in regard to the office of pastor. Pastor, elder, and bishop or overseer. Bishop and overseer being translations of the same Greek word, different translations of the same Greek word. These words speak of uh, the pastor's role by using three different synonyms. And the synonyms speak to different aspects of the pastor's work. A pastor should be a pastor in that he shepherds people spiritually. He should be an overseer in that he oversees the ministry of the word, Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. And then thirdly, he should be an elder. That is, he should have a degree of spiritual maturity. But notice that Paul speaks of this third group, the deacons. The Greek word here is diakonos. It's a compound word made up of two words. The first, dia, that in the Greek means through. The second, kanos, that means dust. It's a word that is generally, generically used in scripture of service. Many times this word speaks of service. The general service that even Believers who are not ordained deacons should render within the body of Christ. You see it used in Romans 12, 6 through 8 to speak of a spiritual gift, diakonos. But here it's used not in that general and generic way. It is used in an official sense to speak of an office within the church. It's really important that we're clear on this. You know, in Scripture, you see other words used in a generic or general sense then used in the official sense like the word apostle it's a word that refers to a sent one and you see all types of sent ones in scripture you see all types of people sent on an official purpose but there are only according to scripture 12 official apostles so there's confusion sometimes on this term because this term is used in reference to all types of service. And as a result, some people water down the deacon ministry and say, well, if we serve in any capacity, we're doing the work of a deacon. Well, we're gonna see in just a moment that there is deacon ministry in an official sense, and that's what we're wanting to respect tonight. And we want to see from scripture that there is all types of deaconing that goes on in the church but then there are deacons in an official sense and there's good reason for that in scripture so why is the name deacon diakonos compound word that means through the dust in the first century world streets weren't made of concrete or asphalt as they are nowadays they were made of Dust, dirt. This name, Diakonos, spoke of one who often ran to the streets in haste and swiftly, quickly moved and cut through the dust to go meet a practical need related to ministry. This is the biblical precedent of deacon ministry. Deacons are ones who cut through the dust to meet practical needs within the church so that the ministry of the word might not be hindered or sabotaged. So if you're a deacon, you're a through the duster, cutting through the dust to meet needs here at Tabernacle Baptist so that the ministry may be strong. This is the biblical precedent 
for deacon ministry. Uh, secondly, I want us to, to think about not only the precedent of a deacon, but I want us to think about the purpose of a deacon. And I want us to look at Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, and just briefly read this passage, and I'll make a few comments on it regarding the purpose of a deacon. Now, Acts chapter 6 gives a depiction of a group of people being ordained. Hands are laid on them. Now, the word ordination is not in the Bible. The word ordained is not in the Bible. It is a word we use to speak of this action we see in the Bible where people are set apart publicly and hands are laid upon them for gospel ministry. Now, we know in Scripture in Acts 13, 3, that hands were laid on those who ministered the word. Here, this is a different group of people who are not given the task of ministering the word. They're given the task of meeting basic needs with practical needs within the assembly so that those who have been given the ministry of the word might minister the word and not be distracted from the ministry of the word. So, so why do we believe that this is the deacon ministry. Well, we're going to see some of the names read or later identified as deacons. That's one reason. But secondly, we know it's an ordained office that's not committed to the ministry of the word. Therefore, by process of elimination, we believe it's the deacon ministry. Now, when we read this passage and we see the establishing of the deacon ministry, we see scripturally that there are several purposes of the deacon ministry. Number one, we see that deacons exist to put down division, to put down complaints or arguments within the church. I wouldn't say to put down because that gives the essence, the, the idea that there can never be a complaint, there can never be an argument. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Sometimes there's valid complaints within the church. Now, like next week, if I start teaching that Jesus wasn't God, please complain. Amen? Um. So, so I don't mean to say that you just put, the, the deacons were, were created to put down complaints. Maybe a better way of saying it is that they were created to help handle those complaints, process them. Uh, because at times there will be reasons for division and complaints and deacons help to keep unity. Look in verse one of chapter six. It says, in those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. So there's this complaint, key word, complaint. Now, how do deacons help process or deal with complaints? Notice this, this is key here. It's not that they just go and confront the people with the complaint, like, hey, let's work it out. No, they recognize that most complaints or divisions within a church come because of some practical difficulty. There is a need not being met. And so deacons step up, not to necessarily go and confront the complainers, but say, why is there a division? Why is there schism amongst the brethren? Why is there a complaint? Usually when there's a complaint, there's a practical need not being met. Let's identify that and go meet it in order to keep unity within the church. This is the context of deacon ministry being established to help handle complaints, divisions, to keep unity, to meet practical needs so that the brothers and sisters can dwell in unity. Number two, what are the purposes of a deacon ministry? They secondly help free up the ministers. They free up the ministers for the ministry of the word. Look in verse two, it says, the 12 summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, it would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom who we can appoint to this duty. Notice that the first group of deacons were men and that there were qualifications. That designation of men 
was in, in keeping with the Lord's design for creation for men to serve as the first place spiritual leaders. It doesn't mean that women don't have a place of spiritual leadership. It means as we see in the Garden of Eden that God called Adam to be the spiritual leader, that God calls, calls men to first be the spiritual leaders. And there's divine design in all of that. And so the rationale here is if men are to be the first frontline spiritual leaders in the home, they are to be the first frontline spiritual leaders in the church as well. That does not minimize the uh, role of women in serving or the role of women in spiritual leadership. Um, in Christ, Galatians 3.28, there is a sense in which there is neither uh, Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, male or female, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. So this does not mean that, that men are superior to women in any way. It simply means that men have been given a role of being the front line, the first spiritual leaders in the home and in the church. And so we see um, Men, and there's qualifications. We'll speak more of that recently, but note, we'll speak more of that later. But notice that the apostles said we need deacons so that we don't have to leave the ministry of the word. If we go and spend our time with this practical need, we will have to neglect studying, preaching the word of God. We'll have to neglect leading ministries that minister the word of God. So we need individuals to help. That leads us to our third purpose of deacon ministry. Deacons help put down division. They help free up the ministers. They third, take care of business related to ministry. Practical needs, perhaps, is a better way to say it, related to ministry. Listen to verse number three. It says, brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. I believe King James has business there, and that translation perhaps in America created, contributed to the creation of an unhealthy form of deacon ministry and an unhealthy, unhealthy form of church leadership that's been rampant in Southern Baptist churches where people re regard the pastor as being the CEO and the deacons as being kind of the board to whom the CEO reports. Now, I would say this, I share this truth not because I'm afraid of reporting to anybody. I first of all should be reporting to the Lord and that is the most fearful obligation I should have. Secondly, I report to an entire body of Christ. So my, my aim in saying this isn't to say I don't report to anybody. My aim in saying this is that we guard ourselves against the unhealthy American-made form of church governance that does no one any good and it goes against Scripture. The idea we see here is that the ministers are ministering the word and the deacons are taking care of practical needs related to the ministry so that, deacon, so that the pastors can go on in the ministry of the word unhindered and unfettered. Maybe instead of the word business there, we could put the word busyness or practical matters. Those little foxes that spoil the vines and keep the ministers from just being 100% devoted to the ministry of the word. This is a purpose of the deacon ministry. So here, just so you'll know, we've identified 10 management processes in our church of practical needs related to the ministry, and we're, we're mobilizing our deacons to serve around those 10 processes. And the ministers are becoming aware, they're, they're being made aware of deacons who serve in those different areas, so when they have a need, they can call on them to help. These are purposes of the deacon ministry. And I would just say this one last purpose, there, there's more I could say, but I, I just wanna highlight this one last one. Deacons can help the church grow. Look in verse seven, it says, so the word of God spread. It's a similar description to what you see Paul, the language Paul uses in 
2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 2, when he asked for prayer of his, for his ministry, he said, pray that the word of God would spread. That is, the word of, pray that the word of God would gain influence over heart, souls, and minds within my ministry sphere. So the word of God indeed spread here in the early church. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Why did the word of God spread? Because deacons did their job. They met practical needs related to the ministry of the word. And then the ministers did their job they gave themselves wholly to ministering the word and as a result of more of the word being ministered, the word of God gained sway over people's hearts, souls, and minds. It gained influence in Jerusalem. And it did so in a miraculous way. Even a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. That's huge. That's like otherworldly stuff. That's like the Holy Spirit is doing something big that people can hardly even believe. You mean Jewish priests, a large group, are becoming obedient to the faith? Yes, and this is what can happen in a church. When a church is faithful to the Lord's way of doing things. You see, the Lord won't give Holy Spirit power and bless us when we try to do church according to our ideas. He'll only bless with Holy Spirit power when we're doing church according to his word. So we see a purpose of deacon ministry. Let me close the message with this and then we'll go into a time of laying on of hands. Uh, Let's talk about the pattern of a deacon's character and and I'll briefly remark on this from 1 Timothy chapter three. In 1 Timothy chapter three, you have what are commonly called qualifications for a deacon's ministry. This is one other reason we believe there are two offices within the New Testament church. When Paul wrote about the qualifications for leadership in the church, he didn't give qualifications for elders, then qualifications for teaching elders, then qualifications for bishops, then qualifications for overseers. He gave qualifications for overseers or pastors or deacons, one group, and then he gives qualifications for deacons. And he says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, deacons likewise should be worthy of respect. They're honorable people, people that people would typically respect and look up to. They shouldn't be hypocritical. That is, they shouldn't be one way in the church and one way in the community. They should be genuine or sincere. What you see is what you get type of person. People of integrity. They're whole, they're sound. They're one at home and one at the church. Not drinking a lot of wine. In our day and age, in our church, we're holding to the conviction here that the best practice is for our deacons to abstain. We see the language there, but we know the association principle in our age. We know the problem with addiction in our age. And I've shared with our deacons that's my conviction that we should completely abstain. Not greedy for money holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. That means you're sold out 100% on board with gospel truth and Bible truth. They must also be tested first. That's one reason for our yoke fellow um, approach is that we give a season of testing and proving. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. The word blameless there, I had one minister define it to me one time, a a pastor was a mentor for me. He said, it's not the idea of perfection, it's the idea you're heading in the right direction. It's the idea of a person being spotless, pure. There's no major blunder or black mark in their life. He said it like this, a deacon who is blameless is a person that though there may be accusations thrown towards them, nothing sticks. He called it spiritual Teflon. Nothing sticks. You see, because this is important, somebody can always, you know, bring a charge against us. 
I mean, we have a deacon, Carrie Roth, with what you do in the community as a city councilman. We could probably find somebody to say something they don't like about you. Maybe, right? But we, know, we know that as public figures. Y'all could find somebody to say something about me they don't like. We, I had an individual one time in a church told me I was a misogynist, and I didn't know what that was. Just to be honest, I, didn't know, I, never, I hadn't heard that word, and I thought, I don't give people massages. What are they talking about? Misog- no, pastor, misogynist. Okay, spell that for me. I went and looked it up in the dictionary. It says a man who dislikes women. I thought, I'm married. I like women. What's the problem? But anyways, so I went to the deacons. I took this letter that had been written. I said, please tell me, is there anything truthful about this and sought counsel? I, I share that to say, Somebody can bring an accusation. This isn't perfection. This is, no, spotless at the end of the day. Spotless. No major blunder or black mark that would bring reproach to this church or to the cause of Christ. If you look at verse 12, it says deacons are to be husbands of one wife. Literally means one woman man. Some have said that this should mean deacon has not been divorced and remarried. Really, the meaning here is one woman man, a man characterized by one woman. So uh, I believe that could mean he hasn't been divorced and remarried, but it could also mean he hasn't been flirtatious, he's not involved in pornography. Um, the, the meaning there could be so much more. Managing their, their children and their own households competently. For those who have served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. Let me just say this in closing. Why are there qualifications? I remember having, a, I believe, a well-meaning deacon one time say, well, you know, we're given those qualifications, pastors, as deacons, because we, we kind of need to be the top-shelf Christians. And people have recognized that we kind of stand out, head and shoulders above all, and that we're, we're fit for spiritual leadership. I remember when I preached verse by verse through 1 Timothy, I began to look at the Greek words used here and look at how they're used throughout the rest of the New Testament, and I found something interesting. All of these Greek words, like not hypocritical, they're used of Christians, the church in general, all the saints elsewhere in the New Testament. In fact, all of these expectations are placed upon the entire church. So why do we have qualifications? Is it, Matt, we have identified you as being a cut above the general ordinary folk. We'd like to lay hands on you. You've kind of graduated from being an ordinary Christian to being a super Christian. Congratulations. Is that the reason? No, the qualifications are here because this is the idea Paul's giving. This is what every Christian should be. And know this great leadership principle, as goes the leadership, so goes the church. And if the people we appoint as leaders aren't being what the average ordinary Christian is supposed to be, God help us. As a a pastor, as I seek to counsel people and I encourage them to keep their marriage together, it's important that I have some one woman men whom give a good example of what a Christian marriage should look like. As I perhaps deal with people who are struggling with greediness and the love of money, may they see in our deacon ministry Christians who have waged war against greed and materialism. And may they see a good example. Lee Robertson, who was previously up in Chattanooga at Tennessee Temple, used to often say everything rises and falls on leadership so the Lord gives us some qualifications of deacons and we've examined Matt in light of these qualifications and shared them with him and we want to now lay hands on him in accordance with with Acts 13 3 in accordance with Acts 6 6 that says when they identified the first deacons, the church laid hands on them or 
the apostles laid hands on them in front of the people. Why? This act of laying on of hands symbolizes a giving of authority and influence within the church. And it symbolized going all the way back to the days of Moses, a transfer of Holy Spirit power and a trust in Holy Spirit power to enable one uh, for the work that is to come. 